Our scripture reading today is from Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. If you're able, please stand as we read this together. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in earth, in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. I'm going to call up Billy Lawson now, and we're going to pray together. Dear Lord, I just thank you so much for this time to meet together to hear from you. Lord, I pray for everyone in this room that we would be open, that we would have minds and hearts ready to hear from you today. And Lord, I pray for Billy. I thank you for the way you've met him as he's planned. I pray that he would be bold and challenge us, Lord, and that he would just be open. Um, and as he says, Lord, I pray that you would just make much of yourself mm. through him today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, you may be seated. I just want you to know none of that was sanctioned, um, but it was all awesome. So never have I wanted to go to C group more. So <clears throat> have you ever felt powerful? Um, I think of a, this is a little silly, but I did an internship in Washingtonville, New York. I was um, still in college. It was my junior year, and I was going to go work at this church in a place I'd never been. I drove my 1984 Volkswagen Golf. I had a crankback moonroof. It was awesome. That's not what I, I did feel powerful then, but that's not uh, what I'm talking about. So I pull up to this parking lot. I, I know no one. I'm going to be doing college age ministry, and I walk in, and I'm just saying, hey, how's it going? My name's Billy. You know, I, I'm excited to be here. And as I'm doing that, they're like, great. Hey, we got youth group going on right now, and the middle schoolers are outside. Can you just go meet them and hang out with them? I just drove like 15 hours. I don't really want to do youth group, but okay, I guess I'll go. So I'm exhausted. I walk out there, and outside, I didn't know what was going on. It looked really bizarre. Uh, I was like, is there, there was like trash cans with like circles around them, and these kids were like launching a kickball at each other. It's like, are we playing Quidditch? Like, what is happening out here? Like, I don't know what's going on. So they tell me they're playing a version of European handball, which is somewhere between like basketball meets ultimate frisbee. And I'm like, hey, okay, cool. And they're like, well, do you want to play with us? And I thought, well, sure. Turns out I'm awesome at European handball, especially against middle schoolers, right? <laughs> so I like see this ball like kind of launching and I just knock it out of the way. I remember like grabbing it and throwing it from half court and it landed into the trash can. And like at one point, all these kids are surrounding me and like screaming and chanting, Billy, Billy. And I felt powerful, y'all. I was like, let's go. I wasn't even there to do middle school ministry, but now I'm thinking about it, right? Like this is awesome. Have you ever felt powerful? Well, have you ever felt powerless? I remember being 17 years old and my grandmother moved in with us. She had had a life altering stroke and she was unable to communicate. It was really hard because my grandmother had always been the rock of our family, praying for us, laboring for us. And I remember one day I was with her talking to her and she wasn't really able to talk back. She would babble and it was strange and I remember something happening and she had pain but she couldn't tell me what was going on and she just started crying and I couldn't get her to communicate and I grabbed my mom and I just felt so powerless. I think we've had moments in our lives where we've both felt powerful and moments where we've felt the lack thereof. Today we're looking at what is the power of the church. We're in a new sermon series that we've called The Dearest Place. And it's taken from a quote from an old Baptist preacher named Charles Spurgeon, who was a pastor in London in the 1800s and has contributed so much to the church. And he says this in a quote about the church. He says, Still, 
Imperfect as it is, the church is the dearest place on earth to us. It is not an institution for perfect people, but a sanctuary for sinners saved by grace, who, though they are saved, are still sinners and need all the help they can derive from the sympathy and guidance of their fellow believers. The church is the nursery for God's weak children, where they are nourished and grow together. It is the fold for Christ's sheep, the home for Christ's family. Last week, we started this off looking at the purpose of the church, and what we discovered was the purpose of the church is really to bring glory to God. It's the glory of God that the church exists to display imperfectly something of the greatness, the beauty, and the perfection of God. See, the thing is, we we talk, right, and I hear all of the conversations that are going on, and we see that the world is weirder and crazier every day, right? Right? And the weirder and crazier the world gets, the more important being the church in the world becomes. But here's the reality. The world has always been crazy. And it always will be until Christ's return. What is so sad, what is so frustrating is when the church stops being the church. And today we're going to look at the power of, and really the power for, the church. And again, I know power can be a loaded word. Right? We've seen lots of displays of people who have exercised power in a way that wasn't good. But again, we also know how awful it is to be without power, to feel powerless, to have no voice. And so today, when we consider the power of the church, here is what we will discover Here's our big idea. The power of the church is the love of Christ. The power of the church is the love of Christ. So with that understanding, let's go to this prayer in the book of Ephesians and let's see first the need for power. The need for power. Let's look at verse 14 together. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being. So it's important that we understand the context of this prayer in the book of Ephesians, right? Being a Christian in Ephesus was not easy, right? It's no easy feat to follow Jesus in this city. If you flip back to Acts chapter 19, you start to understand the challenges the believers face. The church is growing, the church is thriving, and what does it result in? A riot. Okay, so it's not a warm reception that Christianity is receiving in this city. Ephesus is a city marked by spirituality, yet, ironically, it holds an intolerance towards Christianity. It's a port city that's driven by by materialism, it's saturated with cultural pride, and it's riddled with division. So you have a city that's this melting pot of desires, this melting pot of dreams, desires, divisions, and disdain for the followers of Jesus. And in the midst of all of this, Paul gives the church a countercultural calling, He says, hey, despite this tumultuous atmosphere, despite this intolerance that you face, the vision for the church remains unshaken. Paul's prayer and his belief was that the church is not just another religious group. It's not just a group of spiritually aware people. No, the church is distinct and countercultural. It's the body of Christ. And Paul knows how tense the situation in Ephesus is, but instead of praying For change in the external circumstances, Paul prays instead for inward transformation. He doesn't say, God, keep them safe. Protect them from this cultural influence. Protect them from danger. He prays instead for transformation. He prayed fervently that God would work deep within the hearts of believers. And Paul's prayer is grounded in deep theological truths, right? If you flip back to chapter 1 of Ephesians, you see how Paul recounts that believers were chosen even before the world began, that they were marked out to live lives of holiness. Then in chapter 2, he reminds them that even though they were once dead in their sin, they've been resurrected by the grace of Christ 
They've moved from being aliens and strangers. They've been transformed now into citizens and saints. They are sons and daughters in the family of God. And then in chapter 3, he starts talking about the unity and the welcome of the church. That it's not just a testimony to the world, but it's a display of God's manifold wisdom. And now he gets to the point of his prayer, and he's praying specifically for power. Paul's prayer makes it clear. Real strength, real power doesn't come from human effort, but from God's power through the Holy Spirit. Now, this isn't a new message, right? Paul's been praying this way throughout the book of Ephesians. He prayed for spiritual empowerment all the way back in chapter 1. Moreover, God's promise to dwell with believers can be traced all the way back to the Old Testament as we look at passages like Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36 verse 26 says, And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Friends, the idea of God working in power, it's all over Scripture. The question is, why is, why is Paul now praying and making this emphasis on God's power? Well, simple. This monumental task that he's been talking about all throughout Ephesians 3 of forging unity within the church, of God creating this new humanity, it's something that only God can accomplish. If Ephesus is going to, if the church in Ephesus is going to last, right, with all of the cultural pressure, with all of the challenges of people being people, right, people being broken, then they're going to need the mighty power of God at work. And Coram Deo, it's the same for us. Amen. If we're going to last, if we're going to handle the pressure of culture, if we're going to get along, if we're going to be united for the kingdom, it will take the work of God in our midst. Right? If we consider our own human tendencies, often we find it challenging to maintain harmony even with our loved ones, let alone those with different backgrounds, beliefs, behaviors that differ from ours. I mean, think about the people that you love the most, your spouse, your kids, your parents, your siblings, people you'd die for, right? Right? Just think about the last week. How many times were you frustrated at your wits end with those people? Annoyed with those people? How in the world are we supposed to get along with other people if we can't even get along in our own families? Here's the underlying truth that we have to grasp. If the church is indeed God's plan A, which it is, if it's his, if it's his plan A to display his grandeur and beauty to the world, then he must empower it with a supernatural otherworldly power. Because only then will Christ's impact be undeniable, his message irresistible. One day, a father went to take his son to play at the local park. And they get there, and true to toddler state, he sees the sandbox and says, money, that's it, that's my ticket. Runs over to the sandbox and is excited Finds himself mesmerized by the colors and textures surrounding him. And after a short time, he's digging around in the sand to see what treasures it might reveal. And his hands plunge under to discover a rather large rock. And he starts pushing away the sand and he realizes it's really big. And he starts focusing all his attention on like, I got to get this rock out of the way so I can keep playing. And the boy tries as hard as he can to move the rock. He pushes and he pushes and he pushes and he's finally able to get to the rock to the edge of the sandbox. Now the next step is the hardest. How do you get this thing over the edge? She so starts pushing and pushing and pushing until all of his energy is completely fried. The, the rock's stuckness matched the boy's feeling over the situation. And eventually, he did what toddlers do best. He started to sob. He melted down. And the boy's father watched all of this. And as the meltdown started, he went over to his son and began to comfort his overtaxed, dejected son. And he said, son, why didn't you use all the strength available to you to move the rock? And the boy was really confused and said, I did, daddy. It's just too heavy. He said, no, son, you didn't. You didn't ask me to help. And at that, the father takes the rock with a single hand and throws it out of the sandbox. But the church, in all its imperfection, stands as the beacon of God's love. Friends, we are dependent on the Lord for a working of his power. It's not our ingenuity. 
It's not our strategies. It's not the music. It's not the preaching. It's the Spirit of God at work in His people. Right? To shine brightly amidst the darkness, we need the power that only God can provide. Here's a challenge, right? Because people ask, what do you want me to do with this? Really simple. Set a reminder on your phone. Put an alarm for a specific time every day, and when it goes off, pause for a moment. And remind yourself of your dependency on God's power. Use this time specifically. Pray for His strength and your areas of weakness. Pray for this church that God's power would be at work. Friends, we need power. We do. That's what we see first is our need for power. But second, let's look at the purpose of power. Verse 17. Second, the purpose of power. Then jump down to verse 17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Paul prays that you may have strength. And when we think of God-given strength, our our first instinct is often to imagine all the grand missions we could accomplish, the missionaries we could send out in the world, the, the things that we could do, the mountains we could move. But Paul, in his typical fashion, shifts our focus from all the external things that we could do to the internal. The first thing this power is for is making our hearts a home for Christ. When we bought our house it had some issues, right? Still does. Uh, Chaboy Bill is not the most talented when it comes to home renovation and repair, right? But we did things. We had this wallpaper that Hannah was convinced at first, maybe we should keep it. And it was like the kind of wallpaper that you shouldn't keep, you know what I mean? It's really old and dated. And so we started tearing out the wallpaper and painting. And uh, oh yeah, I failed to mention this. My wife was very pregnant uh, at this time. My favorite moment in our home renovations was that as we were preparing for our son, she decided we should get rid of this carpet, to which I said, you are too pregnant, right? We are, we are due in just like a month, right? We don't have time to rip out carpet and replace the floor. And so I threw this picture up so you guys can see. This is what I came home to. <laughs> I asked her if I could share that. Uh, and I said, what are you doing? <laughs> I came home and I saw all the carpet on the side of the road and I was like, Hannah, no, no, no. And I come in and I took a picture because she's sitting there and I'm like, are you okay? She just goes, what? <laughs> all right, let's pull it down before. Oh man, yes, yeah, so it's my favorite picture of Hannah ever. It's just like the epitome of who she is. It's so funny. <laughs> Christ, friends, is the resident of our hearts. So if we think of it as as Christ is moving in, he's, he's redecorating, maybe he's tearing down some old wallpaper, because after all, when Jesus comes into our lives, he's not looking for a vacation rental. He's bought a fixer upper, and he's settled in for the long haul. Amen. So Coram Dale, what parts of the house of your heart have you kept locked or hidden from him? What would it look like for you to spend time this week intentionally inviting him into those spaces? See, we're called to be rooted deeply. The parable of the sower paints this picture. As the sower goes and throws seeds, the seeds land in different places, and some seed falls on the rocky soil. It sprouts up quickly, but just as quickly it starts to wither away because it lacks deep roots. Jesus does not want us to be fragile flowers that wither in the sun. He dreams of us as mighty oaks. In every church, in every age, you find both the strong and the weak, the deeply rooted and the ones who are just barely holding on. Do you ever wonder why we are just sometimes so human? Do you ever wonder why sometimes we we falter? While we lose our our temper, while while we struggle with pride, or we just feel weak. I think the missing link might just be our understanding and experience of the internal power that we house. It's not just about knowing it's there. 
It's about tapping into it, that Christ has taken up resident in our homes, that He wants us to be deeply rooted in who He is. Have you considered the depth of Jesus' love for you? How wide? Think of Jesus' arms outstretched on the cross, encompassing people from every corner of the earth. How long? From before time itself until eternity's end, His love remains unbreakable. How high it reaches to the heavens where Jesus longs for us to be with him. How deep, deep enough that he cried out in anguish, facing the depths of hell for us. And the question we must wrestle with is, do we truly know this love? Do we truly know it? Do you know it? It's been said this way, we can know in three different ways. We can know information. Or we can know things about Jesus. We can, be, we can have inspiration. We can be inspired. Man, that really stirred me. I really liked that. But when information moves from inspiration and actually settles down deep into our hearts, it results in transformation. We change. There's a distinction between knowledge that is purely information and knowledge that transforms. When I invited my friend Kevin to come and visit and preach for us, we talked about barbecue. Right? He's living down in Florida where I guess people love to live, right? You know, if you want to live on the surface of the sun. They got Mickey though, you know, I guess that's cool for them. So we talk about it. I'm telling him the glories of North Carolina and how wonderful it is here. And he says, Yeah, I really want to get some good barbecue. Do you have some good barbecue in your area? And I said, My guy. I got you, right? I got you. I started telling him about my my favorite place, which is JD's. If it's not yours, that's fine. You can be wrong. You can be wrong. And I said, you know, you got to go, man, it's so good. I said, here's the thing, you know, Carolina barbecue is all about the pork, but man, they have great brisket too, which is unbelievable. Everything's good there. And we start talking about it, and he's telling me about his experiences and the barbecue he's eating. And, and, you know, I'm sitting in line with him, and it's one thing to know. Like, he had the knowledge that JD's barbecue is good. And he was maybe even inspired by my talking about how amazing it was. But it was an entirely different thing for him to taste it for himself and to be transformed by its deliciousness. (laughs) I remember he looked up and he just gave me a smile and I knew. I knew. (laughs) Coram Deo, we're called to experience God's love firsthand. We're called to taste and see. D.L. Moody was speaking to a large audience and he held up a glass. And he said, how can I get the air out of this glass? And one man shouted, well, you could suck it out with a pump. Moody replied, well, that would create a vacuum and it would shatter the glass. And a bunch of other people started shouting out suggestions. And Moody smiled, picks up a pitcher of water and fills the glass. And he said, there, now the air is all removed. He then went on to explain that the victory in the Christian life is not accomplished by sucking out sin here and there, but by being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Imagine, Coram Deo, the possibilities If every believer, if every church truly grasped and lived in the reality of Christ's love, its width, its length, its height, its depth, what could we accomplish? We we see a world that is abounding with brokenness. I spent last night trying to read over the sermon, and and I got done, and I finished editing it. And I hopped on YouTube, and, I, and there's this series that's going on where this guy who is a, a journalist is going to different places, and he's highlighting Appalachia. And he's in deep eastern Kentucky, almost to the border. And he's talking about the drug addiction crisis in Appalachia. And we know it. It's everywhere. It's prevalent. We feel it. And he's talking about kids and the depression that they wrestle with. I've had parents here come to me and say, what do we do? Like, how do we love our child? I've had people come to me and say, I feel so hopeless. I feel like no one cares. No one listens. No one understands. No one loves me. And to you, I would say, you can't possibly imagine the width, the length, the height, the depth of the love of Christ for you. What if we believed it? What if our children believed it? What could we accomplish? To be filled with the fullness of God, it means God's not holding anything back. He's pouring himself into us. What would be the result? It would be a church that radiates God's power and his love 
It draws attention not because it's flashy, but because it's real. It's authentic. It's a beacon of hope. It's a testament to God's transformative power. The purpose of this power is not merely for external achievements. It's not merely to solve external problems. At its core, it's about an internal transformation. And it results in a deeper relationship with the Lord. A relationship that you truly experience. The transformation that Paul is praying for is that there would be an overflowing of the love of Christ in and through us. One commentator said it beautifully. He said, we will not live as God's holy ones until we are first aware that we are his beloved ones. We will not treat our neighbors with mercy until we understand Christ's mercy towards us. We do not know anything about Christianity until we know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. So we see the need, the purpose, and finally, we see the source of power. The source of power. Look at verse 20. Verse 20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And we've all had these moments, times when we think, this sounds really beautiful in theory, Billy. This idea of God working in power sounds great. This vision of a dynamic church so alive with purpose. But how? How can it really happen for me, for us? I mean, many of us, we come into this room with tired hearts, often feeling like we're barely limping along in our faith. We're we're grasping for joy. We're slipping into habits that we know are destructive. And some of us might even think, are we, I mean, this messy, imperfect bunch of goobers, are we really supposed to be the beacon of hope, God's living testament on earth? Here's the good news. It's not about our might, but His. Paul exclaims that God can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever hope for or imagine. Think about that. And the word that Paul uses, it's so expansive, it doesn't even fit neatly into the English language. Grammatically, it's weird. Super abundant, right? The NIV says immeasurably. The NLT says infinitely. No one can quite grasp exactly what he's saying. It's almost as if Paul's saying God's power is like, it's like, well, uh, there's nothing to compare it to. This isn't just some kind of force. This is the power of the one who set the cosmos spinning. The one who handcrafted every galaxy, every mountain peak, every river bend. The same God who halted the sun in the sky and brought down city walls with a shout. The same Savior who has defeated death itself is offering us life. Yes. Thank you. Think about that. Take a moment. Reflect on your own expectations of God. Are they limited? Limited by your own understanding, your own past experiences? Challenge yourself, friend, to pray and dream big, trusting that He can do immeasurably more. Do we dare to believe that this limitless power is at work within us? Because Paul's not talking about some far-off distant power, but one that's inside of us, accessible and active. It's like housing a roaring waterfall in a teacup or having the force of a hurricane in a fluttering leaf. See, last week we looked at the the idea that we welcome the weak, right? That we bring glory to God and who we are. The power in this is understanding that none of us have truly arrived. We're all on a journey and every single one of us has profound moments of weakness. But wonderfully, it's in these very moments of of being fragile that God's strength is most evident. God's grace is not just an abstract idea. It's a living, pulsating reality. We can approach Him with open, empty hands and find ourselves filled to the brim with His goodness. If power, friends, is the ability to get things done, if it's the power to change circumstances and people, then that takes us to the heart of the Christian's understanding for power. It's the power of self-sacrificial love and service. There's nothing more powerful than this. 
You see, love can soften the hardest of hearts, the most rigid minds, the stoniest of souls. Love can do what our force in and of itself cannot. When we are loved, we are able to change. When we are unloved, we dig in our heels and we refuse to budge. Love, it's the most powerful force in the world. And it's on the cross that we see the most dramatic, powerful, and profound act of love. The love of God that voluntarily took all human shame and failure onto himself in the person of Jesus. When we lean into his might, we become conduits of his love. We allow the message of Jesus' redemptive work to flow through us, echoing throughout the ages. And the legacy that we leave, Coram Deo, won't be about our strength, but about the one whose power operates mightily within us. You see, sometimes it's in our quiet moments of introspection that we feel overwhelmed. How do I do this? How do I move forward? I don't know if my marriage is going to make it. My kids, will they make it? What do I do? How do I go forward? We look at the fractured world around us. We see the divisions. We see the pain. We see the challenges. We see all that the church faces, and it's tempting to despair. How do we do this? How do we bridge the gaps? How do we mend the broken? How do we shine light in the darkest corners? But Coram Deo, if we truly grasp the magnitude of the power at work within us, again, we'd recognize an essential truth. It's not about us being strong enough, wise enough, or good enough. When you feel inadequate, when you feel overwhelmed, remind yourself it's not about your capability, but His. His grace, friend, is sufficient. His power is made perfect in your weakness. It's about God being all of those things for us and through us. It's a realization that shifts our paradigm. You ever stood at the edge of the ocean, your feet sinking into the sand, waves crashing around you, and you just feel how small you are, the vastness of it all, that sense of awe, wonder, maybe even a touch of fear. Now imagine that boundless ocean force dwelling inside of you. That's the scale of God's power that I'm talking about. And with this power, impossibilities fade. Right? Mountains move, dead dreams resurrect. It's not just about personal transformation either. It's God's power working in us and also working through us that we become agents of change in our community. Instead of merely lamenting the state of the world, we actively participate in its redemption. Not because we possess some unique capability, but because the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is at work within us. It's not a call to complacency, friends. It's a call to bold, audacious faith. A faith that steps out even when the path is not clear. A faith that loves fiercely, hopes unceasingly, and believes unwaveringly in the promise of what is to come. If we look at the early church, we're we're all stunned by it. With all of its faults, its squabbles, its challenges, it was a force to be reckoned with. Not because they had it all together, But because God's power flowed through them in transformative ways, they understood their mission wasn't just for their time, but for generations to come. And so as we stand here in this moment, friends, it's our turn. Our chapter in the ongoing story of Jesus Christ's church. With God's immense power within us, we are called to dream big, to love deeply, and to serve selflessly. A pastor was invited to a play by a friend. He said, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be performing in this play. I'd love to have you come and see it. And he goes, and he was so impressed, so moved by the performance, that later in the week when they were having lunch, he looked at his friend and said, can you, can you tell me something? How is it that you actors hold the attention of your audience so vividly that you cause them to think of things imaginary as if they're real? Well, we pastors, we speak of things that are real. But our congregation takes them as imaginary. The actor looked up at him and said, the reason is plain. Because we actors speak of things imaginary as if they were real, while too many in the pulpit speak of things that are real as if they were imaginary. It was said of one famous old preacher, he showed us the fires of hell, and then he swept our souls up to the gates of heaven. Coram Deo, when we talk about Christ, 
We have to believe in the transforming power of the gospel if we expect to convince anyone of its power to save. What might the world look like if we truly believed? If we truly believed in the power within us that God loves us so ferociously that he has taken up residence within us, what kind of legacy could we leave? To my shame, I've been reading Lord of the Rings for the first time. Don't worry, I've seen all the extended editions a billion times. But I decided to read it. And there's a scene early in the story where Frodo is overwhelmed by the call. And he offers the ring to Gandalf. If you've never seen it and you don't know what I'm talking about, Frodo's the little hobbit guy and Gandalf's the cool wizard. Okay, that's what's happening. This is what we read. He says, You are so wise and powerful, will you not take the ring? No, cried Gandalf, springing to his feet. With that power, I should have power too great and terrible. And over me, the ring would gain a power still greater and more deadly. His eyes flashed and his face was lit as by a fire within. Do not tempt me, for I do not wish to become like the dark Lord himself. Yet the way of the ring to my heart is by pity, pity for weakness and the desire of strength to do good. Do not tempt me. I dare not take it, not even to keep it safe, unused. Sorry to all the wives whose husbands want to go home and watch it now. (laughs) Gandalf is the embodiment of true wisdom, but his wisdom may appear foolish because he refuses to take the ring of power. Gandalf is powerful, yet his is a power found in weakness. Other characters throughout the story reject Gandalf's way, believing the only way to truly defeat the enemy is by wielding the ring. But in the end, they're all unmasked as fools. Their eyes can only see worldly power. They are blind to the power of wisdom. So as with Middle Earth, so with our world, two ways of power, friends, are presented to us. One is the path of wisdom, to know the love of Christ, the depth the breadth, the length. And one is the way to destruction. The only way that we will have a lasting legacy is if we choose the way of dependency. Asking the Lord to fill us up with His power. This morning, do you know that you were loved? Do you know Have you forgotten? Is the cross just something you wear around your neck? Something you see on a building? Or is it tangible? Is it real in your mind? That Christ knew where you and your decisions were leading you. Destruction after destruction, pain after pain, all marching straight to your own end. He takes all of your failures, all of your shame, all of your baggage, all of your what ifs, not yet, I wish, is he bears them all. And he gives you his righteousness. You see, Jesus will make all things new. But it starts here, right here. First and foremost, if you want revival, it starts in the heart. Four questions. Where do I most sense my need to be strengthened with God's power? Where do I most sense my need to be strengthened with God's power? Next. When I hear that Christ wants to make his home in my heart, what reservations or hesitations come to mind and why? Third, how might a greater experience of Jesus' love help me live more for His honor? And finally, if He is able to do more than I could ask or think, what do we need Him to do? If He is able to do more than I could ask or think, what do we need Him to do? We'll put all four up on the screen for those who want to take a picture of friends. We need the power of God at work within us. 
Let's hope and let's pray to that end. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for the hope of the gospel. Thank you for the good news. Thank you, Lord, for the joy that is set before us. Thank you, Lord, that you have not just left us to our own devices, but you are filling up what is lacking in us. Lord, that you are working in power. I pray, God, that you would make it abundantly clear that the same power that conquered the grave lives within us. Lord, that we would dwell on the love of Christ for us. And that as we do, it would transform us. Lord, we ask that you would work in our lives. We pray all of this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.